Uh, good morning, I'm Julian Smith. Uh, I head up uh, what we call Discovery and Innovation for uh, the Specialty Formulations Division. With me is our senior chemist, Brian Hashmeyer. Uh, we'll be talking to you some more specifics on some uh, more on some uh, updates in uh, some of our chemistry. We established this, it's a uh, corn bean rotation. We've uh, uh, established this for a number of years now, and essentially the idea here is to come up with new formulations or test other materials that we may have of use and you'll see a lot of signs that will just say for example experimental uh, both in the, uh, the corn and the bean. At the far end uh, is uh, some starter work in corn you just heard about starters and their importance early in the crop growth stages um, we have both experimental phosphorus formulations, experimental sulfur formulations, and various combinations of traditional 10340 or uh, uh, urea ammonium nitrate solutions with ammonium thiosulfate. sulfate. Um, additionally, uh, you will see plus or minus zinc featured quite a bit in those starter works, not just here but in the, the main block of experimentation. And uh, we've known that the soils here respond to uh, zinc probably 50 years ago. But obviously 50 years ago a good yield was like 100 bushels, now we're pushing 300 plus. So the need for uh, an integrated management system is more the case. Surprisingly, we really don't have a zinc deficiency. Zinc deficiency doesn't necessarily manifest itself in terms of uh, foliar sim symptoms. But by use, utilizing zinc, we see more efficiencies from nitrogen, more efficiencies from phosphorus in particular. That's why it's such a good addition to those early season applications that uh, we heard about this morning. So early in the plant's life, later in the plant's life, when the, uh, uh, the seed is trying to put down its seed protein and carbohydrate, a lot of that is directed by uh, phosphorus, which requires zinc in order to be able to uh, um, uh, partition and, and uh, utilize that uh, phosphate in the seed. So <clears throat> a number of different dynamics going on here that we try and cover the entire growing season. Again, as we heard this morning, say starters plus micronutrients early in the season. The starters come a little, the, uh, the foliar fertilizers a little later as we move into, let's say, glyphosate application. This year in particular, with the amount of disease and insect pressure, later applications of fungicides and zinc uh, and, uh, uh, and insecticides have uh, been uh, all the more important. Clear on through, again, as we heard this morning, to these later stages. Right at VT, you've got about enough soluble nitrogen the plant's going to have and now we need to utilize that nitrogen, whether we partition it into the grain or the rest of the plant. This is where in particular we see better utilization of uh, boron and fungicides um, because we're maintaining green leaf area, we're getting better use of the nitrogen, therefore we've got the chance to boost, uh, boost yield. We can look at things, as you know, of hybrid uh, uh, variants, uh, nitrogen rates, you'll see a lot of that work in the, the, in the main blocks. But consistently over the years, the biggest ROI or return on investment has been the use of a zinc. So a small amount of zinc for every dollar spent is the highest uh, dollar return um, on, this, uh, on this site um, consistently. So what we're trying to do down there is better utilize the zinc at early stages in starters or the strip applications of nitrogen. Uh, in the case of soybeans and corn, we can use that later on in a smart trio or a smart quattro that you'll hear a little bit about. The other thing that zinc confers with us, particularly with manganese in our soils and crops in this area, is that we can also get a little better boost after the herbicide application. In other words, what we'll call stress mitigation. That's what these plots are to the back of you that you'll see labeled these recent plantings of corn and beans, they're basically stress mitigation trials where we've applied a variety of different herbicides. Uh, in the beans right at the far end, uh, we actually have some seed treatment trials this year um, that also incorporate micronutrient <coughs> packages as well as the fungicide, insecticide, and it's our first year working with a true plant growth regulator that we believe will have implications at these very early stages as well as later stages uh, from a uh, foliar application. It's, um, very much an integrated management program rather than look at things uh, in uh, isolation and I think you'll see that as a recurring theme um, throughout the entire demonstration site. With that I'm going to hand over to uh, Brian uh, who's going to share with you some thoughts on uh, uh, some boron applications that we're evaluating here and uh, uh, potential fungicide use. Great thanks. Let's talk about boron first kind of 
in the soil a little bit. In terms of, of amounts, this is a, a nutrient a little bit that's not in the corn tissue very high amounts. You're talking six, nine, ten, maybe high levels, 15 parts per million, but even down to one, two parts per million. So in terms of micro being in a plant at a very, very small amount, it, it's definitely on the bottom end of, in terms of percent in the, in the tissue. Now there's some unique properties to boron chemistry in the soil. It, unlike all the other micronutrients, zinc, manganese, iron, it is anionic in nature, a lot like nitrate or sulfate. Now we've had a lot of rain this year, and what do you think about nitrate and sulfate? What happens to it? It's a leach, you can move down a leach. Well, borate is very, very similar in structure, and it can leach too. Matter of fact, it's the, in terms of all the micronutrients, it's the most likely to leach. Um, so we got that going for us this year. We've had a lot of rain and the possibility to leach boron down through the soil profile. The other thing is, the only way boron gets to the roots is through just movement in the water. The plant doesn't actually go out and, and get boron. It's got to be in the soil solution to move to it. So you've got that limitation. Another limitation you have is the way boron moves up through the plant is via transpiration. And if it's stressed or it's not transpiring right, it may not move boron up through the tissue as well. And when it's not transpiring, it won't. Now typically you think of boron deficiencies in drought situations and more acidic or sandy situations, which we don't have here. <coughs> Having said that, we've been doing boron out here since 2007 via foliar application uh, with the fungicide, or without the fungicide, we get very good results. And we've got a very, very good track record of getting yield results with foliar applications of boron, uh, typically in combination with strobies. Now, there's a few things we've got, uh, a couple different pots we got checked. We got a liquid boron, which is kind of the standard 10% boron that's on the market. Usually it's an MEA complex boron. We have our technology, which is the Maniplex technology, which is in boron. And then we have a new experimental product, O91. So we've got three different boron products out here, all applied at the same time. Now, the 10% boron is applied at a quart. It's a 10%. The Maniplex technology is only a 3% boron, but we apply it at a quart. And the O91, we actually put out at a pint, 5%. So we're putting less and less out. We've done a lot of work in the formulation to improve the efficiency of the way boron moves. So boron is typically thought of as a not mobile micronutrient. So basically it gets in the tissue, it gets fixed into the cell wall, and it doesn't move too well. So if you do see deficiencies, they're typically on the new growing part of the plant. You don't see it all through the whole plant evenly. <coughs> so anybody have any idea what the role of boron plays in the crop? Well, it's very, very important in new growing tissue. Anybody ever see somebody try to build a really tall building without putting any cross braces up? It kind of sways from side to side and you go out and you put a cross brace up like that. And what does that do to that structure? Stabilizes. Stabilizes. It gives structural integrity to the building. Well, if you ever looked at boron at the chemical level, like us chemists like to do, I'll simplify it, it looks like this. And it's bound on either side, and it's a structure-stabilizing element. As a matter of fact, they say it's a cross-linking agent, and that's what it does in the tissue. It cross-links. In particular, it's very, very important to the new growing tissue. If you don't have enough boron up in the new growing tissue, you'll have structural issues and it won't grow as well. And one of the peak demand areas we see for that is during that new reproductive tissue needs a lot of boron. So you get a peak demand at that time. This field this year, we had a lot of rain. It was planted on a uh, cover crop, a cereal rye, and we've got a lot of boron issues. If you walk through there, you can see tassels of all different sizes and shapes. If you have a severe boron deficiency, you're going to be like that. There's a few of these out of there, it's so not a lot. A mild one may look more like this. We've got a lot of these out here. And this is probably a bigger, healthier one. Boron deficiencies will limit your tassel. I'm going to hold up that corn plant over there. So I bet one in every about 20 corn stalks, when you walk through out there, look like this. But you wind up getting a tassel that doesn't form properly. And it forms like that, it's not dropping any pollen. Very little pollen. And you get an ear, it doesn't even soak out. That's a severe. And I don't normally see that on these fields, but we've got quite a bit of it this year. 
The other thing you can see out there is something called bouquet here. This is the pollination issue too that deals with not enough boron. It starts putting out multiple ears because the silks aren't coming out or it's not getting pollinated. It doesn't know what to do, so it just puts out another ear. And sometimes in sphere cases, you'll see three or four or five, like a bouquet, like a bride we carry down. That's why they call it a bouquet ear. So if we look at, look at the treatments that we've done out there, this is a standard 10% boron that we did. These are the, the Maniplex technology. They're bigger ears, but they still have some pollination issues. And this is the 091. Uh, it was put on with a fungicide, somewhere between VT and R2. I'm not exactly sure what the exact timing, but they put it on with a fungicide. You really want, what you wind up having here is right before the tassel, it, it needs a lot of boron at that time. And in the tissues out here, if you take tissue tests, you'll see between five to six or seven, maybe nine parts per million. And, and they're gonna tell you that that's adequate level. And it is probably typically for this vegetative growth, the peak demand there. And you may not be able to harvest it up. Everybody talks about pollination, reproduction, pollination, reproduction. Julian mentioned nitrogen partition and movement. Borons are cross-linking agent, but you know what it cross-links to? Sugars and starches. It helps smooth those. And it'll help fill out the, the grain. So that's really important. Like, oh, you know, you can have really good pollination, but you still have a pretty good need for having the boron here. And if you had a chart, you'd see a peak right before BT for boron uptake and utilization of the plant. And then you see an even sharper one right about R2. Some of you guys, or probably a lot of you, like self-educators. You want to learn as much as you can like me. You're always curious. You're wanting to know what you can do better. If you want to learn a little bit about boron, there's been a lot of boron research in the last couple of years because it hasn't been that well of an understood micronutrient. Take a chance and look up modern corn hybrids of nutrient uptake patterns, Dr. Fred Bilo, just Google that on the web and it'll pull up his paper. And in that paper you'll see how boron moves, when it moves, when is the peak demand of the partitioning, where it goes to the grain, to the stalk, and how it moves. So take a chance if you get, come up here, snap a picture with that and go home and read that. And that probably just came out in 2013. Now in 2014 we have more research um, showing even more how boron moves in a corn plant and how it's utilized, more so than any other paper I've seen to date. If you get a chance, this came out of the University of uh, Missouri, Dr. Paula McSteen. Very good papers to read. They're not overwhelmingly technical. They've got great side-by-side -side pictures, and they'll help educate you in boron as well. Um, one more thing before we're done. We've got Brant Smart Quattro down there, which is a micronutrient. We've been doing a lot of research on that, and that's really geared towards these uh, 2,4-D and dicamber products when they come out make sure that we can mix with them, make sure we don't cause any volatility or antagonism issues. We've been a lot of research on that, um, so there's some fields down there. Um, and I have fully my uh, commercial product this year already, but we're still doing research here. And soybeans are even bigger consumers of boron. Matter of fact, their plant tissue levels are three or four times higher um, because they're flowering all the time, they're setting pods. Uh, you get better pod set, better flowering, better pollination, all of those things. A lot of the, the physiological things I was talking about, pollination and setting, they apply uh, pretty much to any crop, but definitely to soybeans. And it's very common practice to put boron on soybeans. And in fact, we probably sell more boron applications fuller on uh, soybeans than we do corn.